And um, this, by the way, is, let me adjust the lights. Um, you're mostly dealing in chapter 13 here. Uh, but there is one section in uh, chapter 14. I think that's what I mean, that I'm just covering section 14.7. Let me double check that I'm not misspeaking here. Chapter 13 is the Milky Way Galaxy. Um, yeah, I think this that all I meant is that we're going to do 14.7 uh, today, not all of Chapter 14. Ch that, that'll come next time on Wednesday. Uh, but Section 14.7 deals with dark matter, and we're going to see how that ties into the Milky Way. Um, oh, why don't we take a minute and go ahead and grab your clickers since... Um, there are going to be some questions in here. Okay, so uh, what you're seeing on this title slide, if you can see up at the top here, is the band of the Milky Way that we discussed that you probably never see around here. Uh, but, you know, if you can get yourself to somewhere without light pollution or with minimal light pollution, you might see something like that in the night sky. Now, of course, the Milky Way um, was named as such based on mythology. So this is similar to the idea of the constellations being uh, based on mythology. You know, we've got uh, a lot of Greek and uh, Roman myths that play into where the constellations names came from. The same thing is true of the Milky Way. As, this, as the myth goes, um, Zeus, who was what they call, what, a demigod? Who knows their mythology? I think he's like, half mortal, half god or something. And he, they, I guess Zeus wanted Hercules to be like a god, immortal. And so he was going to trick Hera into uh, having Hercules drink her milk because I guess she had another baby. And I guess the idea was while she was sleeping, he kind of put Hercules in there thinking, oh, she'll never notice. But then she woke up and was like, hey, this isn't my kid, and pulled away, and her milk sprayed into the sky, creating the Milky Way. So I guess when you can't really see <laughs> what it is that you're looking at, imaginations, like we do with constellations, go and, um, you know, that fuzzy, cloudy stuff in the sky to uh, people at that time must have reminded them of milk. Okay, of course we know now that that's not actually what the Milky Way is made out of, but the name has stuck. Uh, in reality, what we're seeing when we see the Milky Way is a collection of billions of stars, and our sun is just one of those billions of stars. So because we're looking from inside the Milky Way galaxy, it looks to us like just a band of stars where the most concentrated part of the Milky Way is. Um, but, you know, if you were to look out from outside of the Milky Way, it may appear different. Nevertheless, trying to deduce then what is the Milky Way's size and structure and shape when we're looking from within is kind of, you know, a, a tricky thing. It, it would be like trying to figure out what you looked like without being able to look in a mirror, right? So. Uh, trying to figure out what the Milky Way looked like was really a challenge uh, for astronomers uh, to, to deduce. So starting, we're going to start back around the 18th century, end of the 18th century with William Herschel. By the way, William Herschel is the one who discovered the planet Uranus. There's a really funny video that, that I recommend um, about how Uranus got its name and um, he wanted to, I guess, originally name it King George because that was, I guess, the British monarch at the time. And um, then they called it George's Star for a while. And there, it was a, a big debate about what to call it. But because the other planets 
kind of had this mythological theme going on. Eventually, this name Uranus won over. Uh, but there's a really funny video that explains all of this if you if you get a chance to look up how Uranus got its name. And we don't even have our Futurama fan here to make a reference, but there's a funny episode where um, it, the whole premise of Futurama is this guy gets frozen and comes to a thousand years into the future and then is incorporated into society. So he doesn't know a lot of things that have happened in the intervening thousand years. So this guy says, oh, what about the planet Uranus? Ha, ha, ha. You know, it's funny. It's a funny name. And um, everybody's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And then the, the guy, the professor guy is like, well, we renamed that planet so that people couldn't laugh about it anymore. It's not Uranus anymore. Instead, it's your rectum. So anyway, the punchline is still, it's just as bad. Anyway, uh, this guy did a lot of stuff, William Herschel, including discovering Uranus. But uh, one of the things that he did that's relevant to this chapter is that he tried to create a map, if you will, of what the Milky Way looked like. Um, he was basing this upon his observations of individual stars and then trying to deduce from there what, what the shape of the Milky Way galaxy was. And like I said, it's really tricky to try and figure out what it looks like from the inside. Um, so, you know, he got some things right and a lot of things wrong. Um, but, you know, the basic idea that it's sort of flat-ish... Um, you know, that part is correct because it is more of a disc-like shape than it is a big ball, right? The Milky Way galaxy is more of a disc, and towards the center it is, like, wider or fatter than it is towards the edges. So that rough shape is, is getting there. It's getting uh, what we actually know the Milky Way to look like now. The placement of the sun, however, was definitely inaccurate. And it's a common fallacy that we fall into this trap of, well, we're important, so we must be near the center of everything. You know, it's the same sort of mentality that was the reason people believed a lot for a long time that the Earth was the center of the solar system and everything revolved around us. Similarly, you know, it was deduced, well, the sun must be, I guess, near the center. Um, but in actuality, it's not really that close to the galactic center. In fairness, again, he's trying to discover this from the inside out. And when you're looking at the band, you're not seeing necessarily much in the way of difference from one direction to another. So it was somewhat logical to place the sun here naively, thinking that it might be near the center of the galaxy. But in actuality, we know now that it's not. Okay, so um, what... How was, how was Herschel even able to deduce the shape to begin with, the more disc-like shape that we discussed? Well, he made the following observation. If you were looking out into the night sky and all you saw was uniform um, stars scattered in every direction, right? It looked j like just as many stars here as over here or over there, then it would be logical to deduce that you were part of something that was more spherical or even in shape, right? Um, but in actuality, that's not what we see when we look at the, out in the night sky. Instead, what we notice is that there's an area that has more concentrated stars. So there's way more stars here than there is if I look over here. And that would only be the case if you were looking at something that wasn't spherical, where it's very, you know, even and uniform in every direction. Instead, you must be looking at something that's more like shaped like a disk, because if you're looking along the disk, like in, in this disk part, um, you know, the thicker part of the disk, then you're going to see more stars. But if you look up above, so to speak, of the disk or down below the disk, you won't see as many stars because there's less to go through before you reach the perimeter and outside of it. Does that make sense? Okay, so from that observation, it was possible for William Herschel to say, okay, well, it's got to be something not really spherical, but more squished into more of a disc-like shape. So that aspect was um, probably the most easy part to deduce about the structure of the Milky Way and the shape of the Milky Way. Nevertheless, like I said, he didn't really place the sun in the proper location. Okay, so moving forward in time, in the early part of the 20th century, uh, you had an astronomer 
name, uh, named Coptine. That's how you're supposed to pronounce this, I guess. Um, and he tried to tweak Herschel's map of the Milky Way galaxy and uh, attach maybe some distances to it. Uh, and if you look, it looks a little bit more squished, which is, you know, getting more on the right track. It's more of a disc-like shape even than what uh, Herschel said. So that's a good aspect of what, what he came up with. But um, again, the sun is still placed close to the center, which again, it turns out to be not the case. Um, so in that respect, both Herschel and Coptine were incorrect in where the sun was located. However, um, Coptine was able to, to deduce that yes, the galaxy is actually a lot bigger than I think, I don't have numbers here, but he was able to deduce that the, the size of the galaxy was actually a lot bigger than had previously been suspected. So um, he estimated something around 18 kiloparsecs across, um, which again is still not even the, the quite the right um, size, but it's bigger. It's getting closer to the scale that we're looking for. Uh, so it is an improvement upon Herschel's map. Uh, so the rough features are the same, that it's a disk. He's, they're both incorrectly placing the sun near the center of that disk. Uh, Koptine made it maybe a little bit more disk-like and um, kind of made it larger in its estimated size than what Herschel had said. You came in late and you missed the Futurama joke. I'm sorry. The, when, when they name, rename the planet Uranus to Eurectum. Do you remember that episode? I actually don't. Oh, it's the Smelloscope episode. You should oh, okay. check it out. So, anyway, back to the point here. So, Herschel initially tried to map the galaxy. Jacobus Coptine improved upon it. They're still both underestimating the size of the galaxy, and they don't have, a, they have the broad shape of the galaxy almost nailed down, but not the details of it. And also they're placing the sun a little bit too close to the center of the galaxy. So later on, uh, a man named Harlow Shapley was able to get a little bit better idea of where within the, the Milky Way galaxy the sun was actually located. And he based this upon observations of globular clusters, which are in the out, we know now are in the outlying regions of the Milky Way galaxy. Rather than being concentrated in the disk, they sort of are around surrounding the outer uh, regions of the Milky Way galaxy. And so he basically used the following line of logic to deduce that, you know, Herschel and Koptine are placing us too close to the center. Uh, what he observed is that if indeed we were near the center of the galaxies, then it's a similar argument to when we were looking at individual stars. Whoops. Where did that go? Uh, where if, if, if we were, you know, looking for something uniform, that's what we would see if we were near the center of the galaxy. We would see a uniform distribution of globular clusters now rather than um, individual stars. And so um, what Shapley noticed is that we really weren't seeing a uniform distribution of these globular clusters. And in fact, uh, they seem to be coming more from the direction of the constellation Sagittarius than they were from other directions. And so here's a plot of uh, where the globular clusters are located compared to where the sun is. Okay, And so you see there's way more over here than there are up or down or to the side. And this is the direction of Sagittarius. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, so then uh, Shapley said, well, it's got to be the case then that the center of the galaxy is in the direction of the constellation Sagittarius, which we now know is actually totally correct. And so the sun is actually farther out from the center of the galaxy than either Herschel or Koptine really thought it was. Okay, so here's our modern view of the Milky Way galaxy. Um, so remember that... 
Um, Coptine's estimate was about 18 kiloparsecs across. In actuality, it's more like 30 kiloparsecs across in diameter. And the sun from the center of the Milky Way galaxy is located around 8 kiloparsecs out. So if the whole diameter is 30 kiloparsecs, that means the radius would be 15 kiloparsecs and we're located eight of those 15 kiloparsecs out from the center so we're like more than halfway out from the center of the galaxy right so we're we're closer to the edge than we are to the center in other words um, and we also know that rather than just a bland disk it's actually got some substructure to it so you've got a disk yes but you've also got a bulge region near the center where there's a higher concentration of stars and then outside of the disk is what we're calling the halo region of the galaxy and this is where those globular clusters are located that uh, Shapley observed and, and mapped and found to be more of them uh, towards Sagittarius than other directions okay so this would be like an edge on the right would be like an edge on view of the Milky Way. So if the disk of the Milky Way were like this and then the bulge was sticking out this way. But if you flipped it like this and you were looking at it face on, then you get the left hand diagram. Okay, so this is basically just two different views of the Milky Way galaxy. Of course, these are artist renditions. We haven't actually been outside of the Milky Way in order to like take a picture from the outside, but this is what we would see if we could do that. Um, so the one on the left, as I said, 30 kiloparsecs in diameter, we're 8 kiloparsecs out. And so you can see then that this bulge region that was on the right-hand side is corresponding to the brightest region near the center of this um, face-on view. And then coming out from the center, you notice a, more of a pinwheel shape where you've got what we call spiral arms uh, that wind themselves out from the center. And so we're located about sort of in almost in the center, but not quite of one of these sp spiral arms that comes out of the center of the um, Milky Way. Okay. Here's another view of the same thing. I guess this is a little more difficult to read. I apologize for that. But this is showing you how these things map onto one another. So. You know, this is again the edge on view at the bottom and then the face on view at the top. And then we're mapping the central bulge region to this bright spot here. And then we're mapping this disk to all of these spiral arms and the sun's location to be right here. Now, of course, on the edge on view, you can see this halo region, but on the face on view, you can't really see it because, you know, you're looking kind of you don't see that third dimension from that perspective. Yes? Um, why is it so hard to go outside of the Milky Way? Just the sheer distance that's involved. So, um, again, we were saying, you know, 30 kiloparsecs, but to put that in terms of light years, that's a, whoops, that's 100,000 light years. I realize that's just the diameter as opposed to the thickness, um, but the thickness itself it looks like it's really thin here, but it's actually many light years, um, you know, thousands of light years for you, for you to actually get outside of the Milky Way galaxy. So even traveling the speed of light, it would take, you know, thousands of years to get a spacecraft out there. So we just, I think, haven't had enough time to develop that technology. Uh, I mentioned, I don't know when, but I mentioned at one point about the uh, Voyager spacecraft that was like a message in the bottle that we just sent out. So it's out there wandering in space, but it took it almost 40, 35 to 38 years just to leave the, the solar system. So then to actually leave the galaxy itself, um, you know, would maybe someday in the future it will get there, but it's, it's going to be a while. So would be neat, though. Then we could see the, the thing that they saw in uh, which episode of Star Wars is it? Empire Strikes Back at the end, where there's this nice spiral galaxy in the background. We're just not there yet. Okay, so these spiral arms within the Milky Way galaxy, we've actually named uh, some of the more prominent ones. And so, uh, 
you'll see that the sun is located here at the bottom in this depiction. And so if we look at the next biggest spiral arm, well, the next major spiral arm inward from us, we're calling that the Sagittarius arm because again, that's in the direction of Sagittarius, which is then in the direction of the center of the galaxy. Uh, and then if we look outward, we've got this little spur, the Orion spur that we're sort of part of. And then beyond that, we have the Perseus arm. Okay. And then there's some other arms labeled here as well. I'm not going to hold you responsible for remembering all the spiral arms names, uh, but probably it is a good idea to remember, yes, yeah, Sagittarius is towards the center of the galaxy. Uh, and as we're going to see later, there's something lurking in the center of the galaxy that's also named after Sagittarius. So uh, that direction, generically speaking, being the direction of Sagittarius is probably a, a good point to, to remember. Okay, so we talked about where the sun is located in relation to all the other stars in the galaxy, but how in the world can we get a handle on the actual size of the galaxy? That question uh, turns out that it can be answered by observing variable stars. We've met these variable stars before when we were talking about stars, uh, and we talked about the fact that based upon their uh, period of variation, they have a characteristic luminosity, and then because we know their luminosity, we can work backwards and determine how far away they must be located for them to appear as bright or dim as they actually appear to us. So um, our, our Lyrae stars are the ones that are, tend to be found in the globular clusters and have very short periods. And they're predictably uh, around 100 luminosities of the sun. So if you're looking at those globular clusters and you're seeing something that only appears to be one luminosity of the sun, uh, based on how bright it appears, then you know, well, in actuality, it's actually supposed to be 100 luminosities of the sun, so it must be located at a great distance. And then you can work backwards using the inverse square properties of light and determine how far away that star is located. Now, another type of variable star are the Cepheid variables. Uh, their pulsation rate varies a lot more widely, uh, but it's on the order of days rather than, um, you know, less than a day. Uh, so these, these are, the RR Lyrae are on the order of hours, whereas the Cepheids are on the order of days or possibly even months. Uh, so those Cepheid variables, even though they vary widely in their luminosity, it follows a predictable line here. So you could fit a line there pretty easily. So if you found a Cepheid variable that was, say, 20 days in its pulsation period, then you just, you know, find where that 20 intersects with this um, line, and you see that, oh, that corresponds to a little less than 10,000 uh, luminosities of the sun. So if it only appears to be 1,000 luminosities of the sun to me based on its brightness that I actually detect, then again, I can work backwards and say, well, it should be 10,000 luminosities of the sun, so based on the inverse square properties of light, I can determine now what the distance is because I've got both the luminosity and the brightness. Okay, so in that way, both RR Lyrae and Cepheid variables can be used as standard candles to determine distances within our galaxy uh, or even slightly beyond that. So um, the RR Lyrae stars are primarily what we're looking at in globular clusters, whereas the Cepheids are scattered throughout the galaxy and um, we'll be able to get some yardstick to measure by um, even within the disk of, the own, of our own galaxy. So. Um, the person that really figured this out about Cepheid variables was Henrietta Leavitt, or Levitt, I'm never sure quite how to pronounce that. Um, in fact, that kind of indicates how unsung of a person she is. Like, people have heard of William Herschel, but very few people, uh, I'm sorry, Shapley, uh, but earlier we were talking about William Herschel, but very few people have heard of Henrietta Leavitt, uh, but she was the one who really cataloged a bunch of Cepheid variable stars and discovered that they followed this linear relationship here uh, that's plotted here and uh, that you could then use these 
as a yardstick to measure distance within the galaxy. And so um, that was part of the motivation behind Shapley coming up with a way to um, measure the size of the Milky Way galaxy, uh, but it couldn't have happened without Henrietta Leavitt's contribution to uh, realizing about the, the period luminosity relationship of variable stars. So let's take a, a brief pause and listen to or watch a, a short video about her because I thought it was very cool. How far away is the Andromeda Galaxy? What's, what is the diameter of the Milky Way? How do we even know that the universe is expanding? These are questions that give me a headache, but we can answer them because we can measure the distance to stars. Astronomers do it all the time in a bunch of different ways, but we first learned how to do it only a hundred years ago from a great mind who's as unrecognized now as she was in her own time, Henrietta Swan Leavitt. She was born in Massachusetts in 1868 and attended what would later be known as Radcliffe College, where she studied and excelled at astronomy. But after graduating in 1893, she couldn't turn her skill into a paying career so she gave it away for free. She volunteered at Harvard College Observatory, working in an office full of women who were known as computers, catalogers who sorted, analyzed, and classified hundreds of thousands of photographs of the sky taken all over the world. It was tedious work, but for many women astronomers, it was the only work available. Women couldn't direct their own research at the time, and they weren't even allowed to operate Harvard's telescopes. In fact, women were only allowed to serve as computers because the observatory couldn't find male scientists willing to do the work. So Harvard's computer office became a hothouse of some of America's greatest, if least known, astronomical minds. One of Levitt's colleagues, for instance, was Annie Jump Cannon, who devised the spectral class system we still use to classify stars today. Levitt, however, focused on stars in a cluster called the Small Magellanic Cloud. She was tasked with cataloging a class of stars known as Cepheid variables, stars that go through cycles of varying brightness over regular periods of time. Through her computing, Levitt identified 2,400 new Cepheid it's doubling the number known to science, but more importantly, in 1912, she made a discovery that would revolutionize astronomy. She found that the largest Cepheid stars in the cloud also had the longest periods of peak luminosity. The bigger they were, the longer they were at their brightest. The correlation was so precise that Levitt could measure a star's size and immediately calculate its true luminosity. Now this was a huge deal because until then there was no way of knowing whether a dim looking star was dim because it was just far away or because it was actually dim. But since the stars she studied were all about the same distance from Earth, she had discovered a kind of yardstick. You could pick a variable star anywhere in the sky, figure out its true luminosity using Levitt's techniques, and use that to calculate its distance. This changed astronomy forever. Before Levitt, astronomers could only measure stars about 100 light years away. Thanks to her discovery, what is now known as Levitt's Law was used to measure Cepheid stars millions of light years away. It helped settle the debate about whether other galaxies existed beyond our own, and it was ultimately used by Edwin Hubble to determine that the universe was expanding. Of course, Levitt couldn't do any of this stuff herself because she wasn't allowed to touch the men folks telescopes, but Hubble later said that Levitt deserved the Nobel Prize for her work and he wasn't alone. In 1923, Swedish physicists asked the Harvard Observatory for Levitt's research to nominate her for the Nobel Prize in physics. But, unfortunately, Levitt had died of cancer three years earlier at the age of 53, and though women can get Nobel Prizes now, dead people cannot. That's just one of their rules. So thank you to Henrietta Levitt and all the other human computers who didn't get space telescopes named after them for helping us understand how big and how awesome the universe is. Thank you for watching this episode of SciShow Great Minds. If you have other suggestions for great minds you would like us to cover in this series, please... So... That, in a nutshell, was Henry, Henrietta Leavitt. Um, again, this idea that the, based upon the period of, lum, of, of pulsation, you could determine the luminosity of the star uh, and then work backwards and determine how far away stars were is, is the important thing here. And so um, the person in the video, I don't know his name, but... <laughs> He mentioned uh, that she was looking at stars in what's called the Small Magellanic Cloud. And so that's actually a uh, outside of the Milky Way, a small galaxy that's 
uh, gravitationally bound to the Milky Way. There are two of these kind of clouds, the small Magellanic Cloud and the large Magellanic Cloud, which astronomers just call the SMC and the LMC. Uh, but determining how far away those things were was important, and it became clear that, yeah, they're actually separate. They're outside of the Milky Way galaxy, uh, and so that couldn't have been figured out without this relationship. Okay, so our first clicker question of the day. Take your time. All right, is that everybody? Okay. So, looks like everybody said B, which was, I think that's the correct answer, uh, that the sun, sun was near the center of the Milky Way galaxy. That is correct. Um, so, that would have been the assumption when uh, Shapley looked around if he had seen, um, whoops, if he had seen an even distribution of globular clusters uh, all around in every direction, then the assumption would be, well, the sun must be near the center. But it was the fact that he did not observe that uh, that made it clear that the sun actually is not near the center of the Milky Way galaxy, and in fact, we're more than halfway out from the center. OK, so I've said that the Milky Way consists of billions of stars. Of course, how these stars are distributed isn't exactly random. Uh, in some senses, on a small scale, I guess you could say it's random. But if you look at the larger scale structure of the Milky Way galaxy, it turns out that um, they sort of segregate themselves in terms of, uh, well, they, they didn't do this themselves, but it turns out that they are segregated in terms of their age. So if you look at um, the spiral arms, within the spiral arms, you're going to see a lot younger stars than if you look in the halo regions um, and near the central bulge regions. So um, we give these two, if you will, generations names wherein the older stars are called population two stars and the younger stars are called population one stars. So to me, that's a little bit backwards. I, w I would, I would la label them the other way where the older stars are one and the younger stars are two, but regardless, it is the way it is. The older stars are called population two, younger stars are called population one. Okay, and <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the reason that the younger stars, you've got more blue stars there, is because remember that blue stars do not live as long. So if you're looking at an older population, like a, popul a bunch of population two stars, any star that may have been blue to start out with is long since gone. It has died, right? So let's say that the population two stars were born 10 billion years ago. Well, remember that the blue stars only live for millions of years rather than billions of years, so they're all gone. And all you've got left are um, redder stars that may be aging, um, or maybe some yellow stars still, but you, you've got mostly redder stars uh, in that population. Whereas this younger population has more of a mix. It hasn't been around as long, so you can still have plenty of those blue stars within that population one uh, demographic, stellar demographic. Um, and so the younger stars are more located in the disk in the spiral arms, whereas the older stars are more located um, in the halo or central bulge region. Okay, uh, this 
this sort of indicates something about the way the galaxy was formed that we're going to discuss, um, but that's generally speaking how things are, are right now. The disk then is a region where star formation is still taking place. Whereas when you're looking at the halo and central bulge region, you're not going to really see too much in the way of star formation. This is like, you know, uh, a dying, aging population and aging region of the galaxy. Um, the other thing to note about the younger stars is that they're made up of more heavier elements than helium. Now, astronomers, this is sort of a misnomer, but they refer to anything heavier than helium as a metal, which is sort of silly, right? Because you could still be talking about oxygen or nitrogen, and an astronomer would call that a metal, even though it's not like silver or gold. So when an astronomer says metal, it just means anything heavier than helium. So the, the, the point is that uh, these younger stars have more of the heavier elements uh, and the reason for that is because they are younger. Remember we said that, you know, the silver in your jewelry, it, it came from uh, a star that supernova at one point in time, and then new stars and new planets formed out of the dust of, of a star that had, had passed away. So if you have younger stars, they're forming out of interstellar clouds that are infused with heavier elements from previous generations. And so for that reason, there are more heavier elements within those stars than there are within the older stars that may have formed before too many stars had lived and died. So, you know, they, their interstellar clouds that they formed out of didn't really contain those heavier elements, or at least not much of them. Okay. So, uh, this is another way to kind of put that difference in age and where you see the things. So uh, again, if you look at the younger stars that are a few billion years or less, uh, they're more blue and they're located in the disk and they have a higher uh, percentage of heavier elements within them. If you look at the halo and bulge region, you're looking at older stars over 10 billion years old and they're redder overall because all the blue stars have died by this point and they are following more elliptical orbits within the Milky Way galaxy, and their uh, concentration of heavier elements is very low, okay? And so you can see from this table that the sun, being about four and a half billion years old, fits into this younger population, you know, and that makes sense because we're located within the disk of the Milky Way, and we're just like all these other younger stars, basically. Yes? Ah, that's a good question. Uh, not actually. What will happen instead is that these populations will change, okay? And then this will become an aging population, and then the older one will just kind of die out entirely. Um, so basically, it's just that when the Milky Way was forming, these older outer stars formed first. And then as things crunch down more and, and gravitationally condense more, then younger stars were born inside. But that's a good question. So again, looking at the arms, remember we're in this little spur here, Orion Cygnus, and then Perseus is uh, the next arm looking outward of, from the center of the galaxy, and then Sagittarius would be the next arm over looking inward towards the galaxy. And so the interesting thing about mapping the stars this way is that um, you can see that these are almost like compression waves where uh, the star forming is going to be more likely to happen within these arms because you've got all the gravitational influence of nearby stars. And remember that that interstellar cloud that a star forms out of it starts condensing due to some gravitational interaction of something relatively nearby. So if you were between the arms, the chances of an interstellar cloud experiencing some gravitational perturbation is smaller than if you're within an arm and there's all these stars nearby, then something can trigger that um, condensing of the interstellar cloud through some gravitational influence. 
And so um, it's kind of the same idea as it, you ever go, go driving on a highway and you get stuck in like some dense region of cars and then once you get through it, say you're on a road trip, you get through it and then they're more spread out again. And then maybe an hour later, you, you kind of encounter a more densely trafficked region of the highway. Do you ever experience this? You know what I'm talking about? It's sort of the same idea of these compression waves where the more densely uh, trafficked part of the highway would be like one of these arms. And then once you get through it, it would be like more of the open highway again. And so if you were going to have some kind of fender bender, the chances are it's going to happen when you're in that heavily trafficked part, not when you're in the open highway. So for the same reason, that's what triggers star formation is when you're in this really densely populated region and things can uh, cause this interstellar cloud to start contracting, gravitationally speaking. Okay. So, um, actually that was probably what I should have said for this slide because <laughs> that's showing this taking place. So if you were outside of this, this arm, you know, it's just there, right? Nothing's really happening. But then if you are closer to the arm and maybe you're moving in that direction for whatever reason, now you're going to encounter a more densely populated region. This is the nudge that you might need to start the cloud condensing and pulling in on itself and collapsing into uh, what will become a protostar and ultimately stars or a stellar nursery. Uh, then those stars will form and maybe this, this motion that you had continues and then you find yourself sort of outside. So partly what you said is kind of true, Amelia, that it does move a little, but it doesn't move like out towards the halo. It's still mo movement within the disk. Uh, so then when you kind of leave that arm, you're, you're left with more of the older stars that are going to die. And that's kind of, in a nutshell, how the star formation is triggered by this compression wave, so to speak, which is a spiral arm. Okay, so to answer the question about the populations in the halo and why are they older and, and what's up with that, we need to look more at the formation of the Milky Way galaxy. So based upon what we think happens, this is in a nutshell the timeline and uh, events that occur in the formation of galaxies like the Milky Way. So again, it starts off with this idea of a cloud, right? So only now we're talking about a pre-galactic cloud, which is even more unimaginably large than an interstellar cloud. And within this cloud, you get a similar thing going where there's some rotation that starts happening. And maybe that's enough to get smaller clouds within that cloud to condense and form some stars. This isn't gonna happen really quickly at first, but you know, over a few million years, you might get some stars to form sort of randomly, wherever there happens to be a more dense region. So your distribution of these stars is more spherical to start with because it's a very large cloud. It hasn't really condensed on into a disk-like shape yet. So you might get some stars that are just distributed randomly over a random amorphous spherical shape, generically spherical shape. Okay, the cloud may continue to contract, similar to how an interstellar cloud would, only now again it's a bigger cloud. And now it's easier to get star formation taking place in any of these dense regions near the disk. Okay, but meanwhile you've, you've, you've already had these stars out here that are maybe starting to go through their life cycle and it's been millions of more years and some of them are dying in supernova explosions and leaving only the... Um, the stars that are lower mass behind. As this continues to collapse, you get an even more concentrated disk with the spiral arms. And we talked about how star formation is triggered within those spiral arms. And meanwhile, all that gas that was out here is kind of gone and it's incorporated now into the disk. And so there's really no more star formation taking place in this outer region. And so all you're left with are these older stars that initially formed in stage A of this picture. Okay, um, we're talking about this whole thing 
began, we think, around 13 billion years ago, which is really a long time if you think about it, because the estimated age of the entire universe is 14 and a half billion years. So that was only maybe a billion and a half years into the age of the universe that our Milky Way galaxy began here at stage A. So, you know, that's relatively, I know a billion and a half years seems like a lot to us, but in the age of the universe, it's really not that much. Uh, and so that's how you end up with these population two stars in the outer region and the younger populations one stars in the disk. Yes? Yeah, there's always some amount of rotation happening. And so our sun is sort of, if you will, orbiting the center in a way. Um, I don't think it even gets one orbit around in its lifetime. But, um, you know, it's got that overall motion to it, that overall circular motion to it. But based on how large the galaxy is and the fact that our sun only lives 10 billion years, you know, it's going to take a while to get all the way around like that. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so speaking of the rotation of the galaxy, um, there are a couple ways in which the galaxy could be rotating. If you were just to guess, how are these stars rotating about the center of the galaxy? There are a couple models that you could come up with to, ex to maybe predict what their rotation speeds would be. So in the first model, this is obviously almost right off the bat, we can throw this out the window because it doesn't make any sense. But if for whatever reason it was the case that the Milky Way galaxy was a solid disk, like a CD or something, or DVD, then everything would be like attached to the disk physically, right? And then as you spin your CD or your DVD, you could predict the speed that a point uh, you know, near the center of the, of the DVD was spinning compared to a point near the edge, right? And if you looked at it that way and you marked off some points, say you did this with a marker on your DVD, here's the center of the DVD, you mark point A, B, C, D, and then you get it spinning. And what you'll notice is that point D is moving a lot faster than point A and then B and C are in between. And that's the same reason that if you were ever on a playground as a child and you're on one of those little spinning merry-go-rounds. If you go near the edge, it's like, whoa. But if you go near the center, it's like not so bad, right? Because you're going a lot faster near the edge. Of course, like I said, I don't think anybody really entertained this idea that the Milky Way galaxy was a physical solid disk. So we kind of know right off the bat that this idea of how fast each point would be traveling is probably not correct. So instead, let's take a look at something like our solar system. Our solar system is governed by gravitation, the force of gravity, right? And uh, how fast the planets orbit around the sun depends upon how far away from the sun they are. For example, Mercury that is very close to the sun is orbiting way faster than we are a little farther out. And then if you look even farther out, to Jupiter or Neptune, those gas giant planets are moving even slower around the sun. They're sort of lumbering about, taking a very long time to orbit the sun. This kind of motion is what we would call Keplerian motion because you remember uh, way back when, when I talked about Johannes Kepler and how he discovered the nature of the orbits of the planets around the sun, um, you know, this is named after him. Uh, this Keplerian idea is just basically based upon the force of gravity because the closer you are to something, the force of gravity is stronger. So if you are close to the center, you're going to go faster than if you're farther away. So if, if the planets, if, if the Milky Way galaxy was like the planets in our solar system, then it would be the case that a star that's orbiting near the center of the Milky Way galaxy should be going fast, whereas a star that's near the outer regions of the galaxy should be going slow. This is all based on the assumption that lurking here at the center is the most massive part of the galaxy, right? Because that's what you're closest to. In the solar system's case, that's obviously true because at the center we've got the sun. 
and the Sun makes up 99% of the mass of the solar system. With a galaxy, it's a little less clear. Is that central bulge region the most massive part about our galaxy? If it is, then I should expect some kind of pattern similar to our solar system, where stars near that massive central bulge region are moving really quickly, whereas stars that are farther away from that massive central bulge region are moving slower. However, if we actually empirically measure the speed of the stars based upon their position in the Milky Way, we do not observe what we might expect based upon our solar system. What we see instead is something like what's depicted here in C, where it turns out that doesn't seem to matter a whole lot where you're located. The speed with which you orbit the center is relatively flat. In fact, if anything, it, it may be increasing slightly as you get near the edge. So what's up with that? How can we explain that star D near the outer part of the Milky Way seems to be defying the laws of gravity, where it's traveling really quickly, way more quickly than we would expect if all the mass was concentrated at the center? Well, that's the caveat, right? We were assuming that all the mass was concentrated at the center and that the center of bulge region must be the source of the greatest mass within our galaxy. And so it turns out that that can't possibly be the case, right? Because if it was, then based upon the laws of gravity, I really expect this. So either the law of gravity is wrong and it's not universal, it doesn't apply to galaxies for some reason, or there's mass somewhere that I'm not seeing that's not all concentrated in the bulge. Okay, and so we're pretty confident that we understand that the universal law of gravity is what we think it is. And so uh, astronomers and physicists have been less likely to just abandon the universal, universal law of gravity that Newton discovered and say, well, there must be some mass somewhere that I'm not accounting for, that it's not actually concentrated in the central bulge region. There must be mass elsewhere that is causing these outer stars to rotate way faster than I would anticipate if all of the mass was at the center, okay? And so this quote unquote missing mass can be calculated based upon what we think is the case that Newton's universal law of gravitation holds. We can then plug in all the rest of the stuff that we know, the velocity, the radius, uh, you know, the universal gravitational constant, and we can come up with the mass required to give us the speeds that we see uh, of those stars. And so if we do that, uh, then all the mass within the sun's orbit should be about this many solar masses. Okay, and then you can go further and estimate the mass of the entire galaxy. It should be around this many solar masses, 2 times 10 to the 12. That's like a 2 with 12 zeros after it. So we're talking a very large number. Uh, this is way more mass than what we can account for based upon everything that we see. So if we look out into the Milky Way and we see stars and we see evidence of planets and we see evidence of black holes and all interstellar clouds and we add up all of the mass of all of those things, we're getting nowhere near the mass required to explain these speeds. And so for that reason, Scientists have proposed that there's some matter that we can't find for whatever reason. We can't detect it by normal means. And by normal means, I mean it doesn't really give off any kind of light that we can see, whether it's invisible light or visible light or anything else. Uh, it's, it's basically only detectable through its gravitational influence. It's clearly influencing things gravitationally, but we're not seeing it, we're not detecting it in any other way that we can find. And so since we really don't know what this mass must be, we just call it dark matter. It's very mysterious and nobody really knows at this point what it is. Um, there are a couple hypotheses uh, do I talk about this in the next slide? Uh, okay. Uh, there are a couple hypotheses as to what it might be, uh, but so far nobody really has any conclusive evidence uh, as to what dark matter is. 
So in case you might be saying, well, what if we're just measuring our, you know, speeds incorrectly within the Milky Way galaxy? It turns out that there's even more evidence for the existence of this mysterious dark matter than just the speed of the stars in our own galaxy. Um, there are other effects that we can see. Uh, what we think is that whatever this dark matter is, it must be distributed more like a sphere in the halo regions of the galaxy, uh, and that it must extend very far out, 100 kiloparsecs across, rather than just 30 kiloparsecs across, right? This is 30 kiloparsecs, and then whatever this dark matter halo is, is 100 kiloparsecs in diameter, okay? And whatever's out there, that dark matter, has to be at least 10 times more than everything else that we know of in the galaxy in order to account for the speeds that we see. Now, like I said, in case you were tempted to think this is just some quirk of the Milky Way galaxy, we've actually looked at other galaxies nearby and tried to map their speeds of their stars uh, orbiting around the center of their galaxies. And what we find is very similar rotation curves, these are called rotation curves, that plot the distance from the center on the x-axis and the speed on the y-axis. So here's our Milky Way again, marked in uh, purple or red or fuchsia, whatever this is. But here are some other galaxies with their rotation curves plotted, and you see a similar phenomenon where it's just relatively flat and perhaps even slightly increasing near the outer edges. And so these stars are just defying what we would expect if all this mass was located at the center. In other words, this dark matter, it seems to be a phenomenon of other galaxies as well. And so that makes us a little more sure that it isn't just some quirk of the Milky Way galaxy. It isn't something that we're mismeasuring. It's seen in other galaxies as well. And the only way to explain it is if there's some kind of mass out there that we're not seeing. Okay. Some other pieces of evidence for dark matter is that the uh, galaxies that cluster together are moving faster again, just like individual stars are moving faster, galaxies within a cluster are moving faster than we can explain by, again, all the mass that we can see. So, again, there has to be some mass that we're not seeing. Uh, in addition, there are some optical effects that you can sometimes see, such as the bending of light. You see how there's all these weird optical effects in this picture here? Uh, the bending of light near uh, galaxies, which must be due to some sort of mass because mass, according to general relativity, warps space-time. And if space-time is warped, then the light has to take a deviated path to get to you. So any kind of weird optical effect where things are, you know, not where we expect them to be seems to indicate there's something massive warping space-time and causing the light to deviate. And so again, that's another piece of evidence that there's some matter out there that we cannot see, which we again we call dark matter. So um, what could it be? Again, there are theories out there, there are hypotheses out there, I should say, uh, because none of them are really to the point of being a theory, uh, but nobody really knows for sure. Normal objects like that don't give off light, such as a black hole or a brown dwarf or really faint stars, even if you could put a reasonable estimate on how many of those you're missing, there's still not enough to account for uh, the mass that would be needed to explain these uh, effects that we see. And so our best guess right now is that it involves some sort of weird particle that we don't really understand or know much about. Um, this, this at least has some possibility of being true because these other objects really can't account for all the mass that, that's missing, so to speak. Uh, but the nature of whatever weird particle this would be, we know nothing about. And we don't have any evidence for it either, because clearly it must be something exotic enough that it only exists in these outer regions of the galaxy. It's not something that we can just create here on Earth in a, in a particle accelerator. It's not something that we've really observed directly. We've only ever seen this gravitational influence, either due to the speed of stars or the speed of other galaxies in a cluster, or the warping of space, uh, which is also a gravitational effect, which causes optical things in, in some of our pictures. 
Uh, so the machos and the wimps are our two hypotheses. The machos we don't think can count, account for all the mass that we need. Uh, machos stands for massive compact halo objects, which would be all those things that don't give off light, like black holes, uh, brown dwarfs, a very faint white dwarf. Uh, we don't think that can account for all of the mass required. Uh, so the machos, although they sound really strong, don't seem like they're going to win this battle. Um, perhaps that's part of the picture. Perhaps that does account for some of the missing mass. But still, we've got to invoke something else to explain the rest. And so this weird particle thing we call the WIMPs. Uh, WIMPs would stand for weakly interacting massive particle um, weakly interacting means it doesn't interact in any other way that we can detect other than gravitationally. It, it interacts weakly in the sense that it's only through gravity, gravity that we see that, the effect. And again, this is more hypothesis, speculation. We don't really have any hard evidence to go on. It remains a mystery. Okay, so actually before we do the clicker question, um, I want to show you a short video of Neil deGrasse Tyson, who we looked at already once before, and his explanation of dark matter I think is really good. So, Sorry about the ad, guys. There we go. Hi, I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson. I'm an astrophysicist with the American Museum of Natural History, and I'm host of Star Talk Radio. Welcome back to Star Talk Radio. <laughs> and it's fighting all these air molecules. Like, what's up with that? We win. Astrophysicists win. Oh! Yeah, I said it. Snap! Bada bing! Well, 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 I'm getting it! Dark matter. I get asked what it is, and my best answer is, we haven't a clue. <laughs> we don't know what it is. We look out in the universe, and 85% of all the gravity that's out there has some mysterious unknown source. We add up all the stars, the galaxies, the planets, the comets, the black holes, the dark clouds, everything out there that we can see, touch, smell, or taste, and it doesn't add up to give us the gravity that we see operating in this universe. So really we should be calling it the dark force, because we don't know if it's made of matter. It could be a profound misnomer, sending people off in thought directions that might not really be the right path. So dark matter is just simply what we call this thing about which we know nothing, responsible for 85% of the gravity of the cosmos. We've known about dark matter since the 1930s. Back then it was called missing mass. That's what it was called. Because Yeah, there's got to be some mass. Where is it? We can't find it. It's got to be here somewhere because we got the gravity. If you have the gravity, you got to have the mass. Mass and gravity go together. Uh, it's really dark gravity. Actually, we shouldn't call it anything. We should call it Fred. <laughs> Something that has no meaning, because we don't know what it is to call it. But it, has been a, it is the longest standing unsolved problem in modern astrophysics. So anyway, if you want to hear more of Neil deGrasse Tyson, you can always check him out on this Star Talk radio. Uh, but I really like his explanations for things. Uh, like he's saying, we don't really know. It's really speculation. It's anybody's guess at this point. We just know that we see this gravitational effect. Okay, so, Claker question. Is that everybody? Okay. So, most of you put C, which is the correct answer. So, let's take a look here. Um, uh, so, the rotation curves around the Milky Way and other galaxies. That's how we first got the picture that, well, there's something out there that, that's missing because these stars are orbiting a lot faster than we would expect especially near the outer regions of these galaxies. 
the bending of the light we mentioned as being due to the mass that we're not seeing warping space time and causing the path of light to deviate uh, and the clumping together of the galaxies and their enormous velocities again speaks to some kind of missing mass that we're not seeing uh, but as I said before, we don't know what this, if, the, if it's some kind of weird particle, we don't know what it is. We haven't been able to produce this particle in any kind of experiment here on Earth. So uh, that, is, that is the thing that really isn't evidence for the existence of dark matter because nothing we've done so far in a particle accelerator has corroborated this idea that there's some exotic weird particle. So as of yet, it remains a mystery. Okay. So, remember that I said, though, that something is lurking near the center of the galaxy. And this is actually kind of remarkable when you think about it in light of dark matter. There is so much more of dark matter, whatever it may be, than there is whatever's lurking at the center of the galaxy. But at least in terms of matter that we can detect, this is the biggest thing about the Milky Way. If we look towards the center of the Milky Way galaxy, we notice that the density of stars is extremely high. We're talking um, 100,000 stars per cubic parsec. And remember that a parsec is about a little over three light years. So, you know, three light years this way, three light years this way, three light years this way. You take a cube that's about three light years in every direction, and you're seeing 100,000 stars. That's pretty crazy when you think about it, right? Because where we are in our part of the Milky Way galaxy, the closest star to us is over four light years away, which would be beyond a, a parsec, right? So we're basically the only star within our cubic parsec where we are. But near the center of the galaxy, you would have 100,000 stars within that same amount of space. So, you know, stars would be maybe as close as the outer regions of our own solar system uh, might be our nearest star. And so um, you can imagine what kind of gravitational uh, embrace that might cause or havoc that might cause uh, with stars that are that densely packed together. Uh, also, if we look towards the center of the galaxy in the X-ray or gamma ray region of the spectrum, what we are seeing is evidence that there's some kind of black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. In fact, it's a, an extremely massive black hole, a supermassive black hole that is over 4 million masses of the sun. Um, and so we call this Sagittarius A because it's in the direction of Sagittarius because that's the direction of the center of the universe. Or I'm sorry, the center of the galaxy again. So um, this very massive, supermassive black hole in the direction of Sagittarius, i.e. in the direction of the center of the Milky Way, is 4 million masses of the sun. So as far as things that we can detect that aren't dark matter, that's about, you know, the biggest thing that you're going to find within the Milky Way galaxy. Okay, here are some images that show the gravitational influence of this um, <coughs> black hole, <coughs> excuse me, near the galactic center, and you can see the tight orbit that some of these stars are on and how densely they're packed near this <clears throat> central black hole. Okay, here's, uh, for example, where the black hole might be located, and here's a star that's in orbit around it, and you see that within 20 years, it's already you know circled more than halfway around that, so it's going relatively quickly. Uh, that's only 0.01 parsecs. Uh, that's, that's a really tight orbit that it's on, uh, and, and that can be explained by the tremendous mass of this central black hole. And so it turns out, I, I don't say this in this slide show, uh, but we'll talk about it next time. It turns out that we suspect that there's a supermassive black hole at the center of basically every galaxy. So the, again, the Milky Way is not some quirk or some unique thing. Uh, it's probably the case that there are supermassive black holes at the center of all, all galaxies that we know of. And as massive as they are, again, millions of times the mass of the sun, still <laughs> there's even more dark matter in those galaxies than, than the supermassive black hole and everything else combined. Okay, so I think now is probably a good time for us to take a break. 
let me just stop our recording. Were there questions before I do that? Yes. So, there are like different shapes of galaxies. Uh huh. So what, do we know like what causes the different shapes? Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, we have some ideas. And so um, you might have to wait <laughs> until the next lecture, but we will talk about uh, the different shapes of galaxies. In a nutshell, we think galaxies like the Milky Way are galaxies that have been fortunate enough not to have had any close interactions with other galaxies. Galaxies that are more irregular in shape or elliptical in shape may have experienced collisions or other interactions with galaxies that have, you know, gotten rid of that nice pinwheel spiral arm shape. Uh, but we think that most galaxies start out at least with a similar structure to the Milky Way. Okay, and like I said, we'll talk more about that next time. Other questions? All right, so 